Howdy folks, Craig Lovato here with the Houston Museum of Natural Science and the Beyond Bone Zoomcast. Today we're talking to Dr. Dirk Van Terenhout and he's given us an update on the John P. McGovern Hall of Americas slated to reopen in September of 2022. That's very far away, but very close. Howdy folks, Craig Lovati here with the Houston Museum of Natural Science. This is, of course, the Beyond Bones Zoomcast. As always, I am joined by my co-host, Kat Havens. Hello, how's it going, guys? Very good, very good. I understand it's a busy day at the museum today. It uh, is. There's lots of activity. Uh, we're closed today. Today is Wednesday, October 13th. Had to look at my calendar and we're having a special luncheon up there right now. So uh, all the dinosaurs and everything are getting a, a well-deserved day of rest. It's been a lot of busy, busy days at the museum lately that I can't mm -hmm. talk about. But um, yes, we'll have more on that in a few months. Uh, let's just suffice to say I stayed up at the museum until 2 a.m. last week. Oh, my. Yeah. You we, spent a night at the museum, Basically, Fred. yes. Nothing came alive. I'll but give you a T-shirt now. You can have I, a T-shirt. I was there very late, but it's all going to pay off. I'm very excited. Today is a good, uh, it's a good, it's a good little segue to uh, things changing at the museum. We're going to be talking to Dr. Dirk Van Terenhout, one of my good buddies, a, a fellow Saints fan. Uh, Who that, baby? There Sports we go. There tech. we go. I'm an exiled uh, Texans fan, and I decided to uh, root for the Saints. And so me and Dirk can always talk about the Saints. Of course, I'm also wearing my Astros hat because uh, we're going to the ALCS, guys. That happened last night. So, uh, yeah. And also, I didn't shave my head this week, so uh, I'm a little furry up there. Uh, we're going to be talking today about the uh, – John P. McGovern Hall of America's version 2.0. And if you've been to the museum lately, you probably see, you've probably been turned away from the third floor. The third floor is just a flurry of activity right now. Uh, we are getting ready to install the world premiere of the Ramses exhibit. We are getting ready to unveil our new version of the Hall of Ancient Egypt. Um, and Dirk and his team are also working on reimagining the Hall of Americas. And uh, we're hoping to reopen that by September of 2022. That feels very far away, but also very close when you realize that Halloween is like in a week and a half or something. So yep. this is just, we're moving at a very fast pace. There's a lot of interesting things going on at the museum right now. Uh, I will say this, that a lot of people have reached out and said, Hey, you guys are always like, there's so much stuff going on. I'm like, yeah, we're trying to get things like really awesome for the winter and fall. And, uh, you know, sometimes you just got to close some things down for a day or two and make everything shine. So Dirk, uh, what's going on with the hall of Americas? Um, what are some of the things we can expect out of this new version? Well, as you mentioned, this is 2.0. It will still be on the third floor at the museum. The original 1.0 uh, version started in 1998. So it was time to update it, refresh it. And basically, in this case, it meant a complete overhaul. It will still be the same space, 9,000-ish square feet. Um, what we will a big see, apartment. Very big. It's like <laughs> a big apartment. <laughs> Yes. Um, well, if you have a few dollars, yes, of course, <laughs> it's a really big apartment. Um, in the past version, the previous version, we had nine sections. This time we'll have one additional section dedicated to the Amazon. Uh, it so happened that we had a few pieces at the time, but it was not until the first hall had opened for maybe a year or two that the museum acquired and received donations of Amazonian material to the point where we're now one of the larger um, holders of Amazonian ethnographic material, rainforest people, uh, body costumes, featherworks, and things like that. And so over the last roughly 18, 19 years, the museum has built temporary exhibits, um, some of them also on the third floor, dedicated to Amazonian ethnographic cultures, but not as part of the floor space. 
that is the Hall of the Americas. So we wanted to showcase what we had, but we couldn't quite yet do it inside the Hall of the Americas. Uh, we also sent some of that material on the road. So it went from California to Alabama to Philadelphia and then uh, Texas, in Texas, and finally to the museum. So all of that to say um, the new hall will incorporate an additional section that means Amazon, but also will have different approaches in that we want to highlight the fact that Native American cultures are still with us. It is something that, that uh, you hear about in um, indigenous museums. It's painted on their walls. We are still here. And we want to convey that to all of our visitors um, who may or may not know this. And in some cases, it is clear they do not. Uh, because even in the previous hall, there were here and there references to the fact that, yes, we still have people who are descendants of the or original inhabitants. Um, and people will go, wait, I thought they were all gone. And so those stories we want to emphasize in the entrance uh, portions of the exhibit and then in as many ways as possible, each of the uh, 10 sections that are now making up the new hall. That is really cool. And I remember uh, the Amazon exhibit that we had with all the feather work um, mm -hmm. and things like that. And I'm really excited to see it come back and kind of have a personal space, its own little space in the museum or in the Hall of the Americas rather. And I love that it's going to be such a great tie in to sort of scaffold with the rainforest um, and the butterfly center. And we can sort of, you know, teach cross curricular cross curricularly that way you know mm -hmm. tying in the science um with the history and the um anthropological kind of, of branch of the museum so. right um i think that's an important point you make at trying to connect the dots as i like yeah. to call it not exactly. only within the museum uh, but in the storyline and with other parts of the collections on display mm -hmm. for example uh, tina uh, petway our malacology curator and i have been talking a lot about making sure that we emphasize and elaborate on those places where we can make the connection to our malacology or shell. Sure, sure. So human beings have been using shells for a long time and whenever and wherever they incorporated them in their material culture, yep. uh, we should share that. And As money, that. as decoration, as all kinds of different things. I think that I find that fascinating too, that yeah. everything is so enmeshed. It reminds me of like cabinet of curiosities and those kind of connections that you were supposed to make looking at all of the random items and being right. able to kind of draw those things. So that's really cool. That's really cool. Is any yeah. of the, uh, the stuff from the previous iterations of the hall, is that going to be staying or is that some of that stuff going to be retired? Both. So there will be items that will be on display or belongings that will still be on display. Um, let's start with the architectural renderings that people may remember uh, in the hall. So we have a Northwest Coast facade right. that was commissioned by the museum for the museum, but it was made by indigenous artists. And so people from the Northwest Coast made a building facade. Mm -hmm. They made a transformation mask and they also carved their house post. Mm -hmm. Those are um, original objects that were made for the museum, so they were not taken away from their original place. They were made in the point of origin by people of the culture, but for the museum. So that was at the first hall, and they will it will still be in the um, 2.0 version. Okay. The same thing applies for our Maya building facade, the doorway that you entered through the mouth of the earth monster. It will um, be on display, but it will be in a different place because everything has been moved a little bit to make space for the Amazon. And so that will still be there. Now in the center of the hall, there will be a new, so I call it a traffic circle, a roundabout. We had- uh Oh, one... that's scary for Houstonians. Big Ben, <laughs> Parliament. That's all I can think of when you say that. <laughs> We'll Look, have kids. traffic. We'll have traffic cameras there. And, there and we go. Good. Okay. Make sure everybody <laughs> uh, learns how to navigate. But we used to have right by the Maya section and the Aztec section and the Andes section. We used to have a fake rock traffic circle, if you want, with a um, replica of a uh, Pacific Coast Guatemalan jaguar statue. Right. 
So that guy has been retired. Oh. And now we will have a different display, which is going to be a monument yet to be made um, from Canada by an Inuit person who um, will come down early next year to work with the museum, in the museum, uh-huh. with original stone material, not from Canada. He, we cannot ask him to bring a few thousand pounds. All right, can you bring your rocks. rocks with you, please? Yes, in the overhead bin, it would be a problem. But we will go source materials in um, central Texas oh, cool. and bring them back to the museum. And he's going to build what is known as an Inukshuk. Um, or a cairn, if you want, but it's ah, that's what I that's the word. Would you say it again? The first one, Inukshuk. Inukshuk. Yes. We were having this conversation just the other day about what it was called, and I said it's like a cairn, and they were like, "No, I was right." Sorry. There little, you go. Little interjection you there. It. You can show that to your friends now. Inukshuk. Okay. Inukshuk. Yes. So uh, the gentleman who is coming down to make this is, as I mentioned, Inuit. It is part of um, his culture. That's cool. And. The monument in its own right, which will sit in the center of the exhibit, um, hopefully will draw people in. That's the intent, including teachers with their uh, school groups. And from that traffic circle, they can then radiate out to whatever section they would like to see in the time they have. Mm. But the monument reflects a sentiment that we want to emphasize. And as I mentioned earlier, we are still here. And the Inukshuk monument is one in which when he sees them, he shared online and he will share it again, I hope, in a video we can make of him. It reminds him when he sees them in the landscape up in the northern part of Canada, that these monuments have been made by his ancestors since time immemorial. And they are still doing it today because they're still here. And so this new monument made for the museum by an indigenous person will without saying it, but we'll have a text panel explaining it, that we were here, we are still here, in, in a nutshell, but it'll yeah. be a 3,000 pound nutshell. Can I ask you a question about it? Sure. So were they, what do we know even? Cause it's obvious it's, is it referred to as a monolithic uh, feature, mm. megalithic, or it's is it It's not smaller? monolithic because it will be, imagine large, roughly shaped, rectangular shaped um, blocks of rock right? that will be piled on top of each other. And in the case of the museum, we will, uh, we have already discussed, and, and this, this is fine with uh, the artist, uh, the, the creator, that we will uh, drill holes through them and put um, big metal rods through them. Stabilizing. So stabilize it. Yeah. Just in case you never know, a very enthusiastic <laughs> seven-year-old decides to, to climb. break loose and climb it. Yeah. We want to make yep. sure that people can do it. Without... Got a plan for everything. Yes. Yes. That is not done in nature or this is not done no. in the original situations. But so right. it's not a sin- single monolithic block. Okay. It's not one of those um, trillithons from Stonehenge. Right, 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 right. It's a different configuration. But do we know what they were meant for? Were they property boundary markers? No, they, they were... A play, they were sort of indicators of, and for, you have to be a member of the culture to really appreciate and understand them. Okay. My, my understanding is that they are markers, for example, if you walk up to them and you survey the landscape, um, you, because of being a member of the culture, would realize that, oh, this is referring to further down in the valley, there's a river, that's the place we can ford. This is the place where maybe at the right time the caribou migrate. This is where you can go fish the salmon. Um, so these are not so this is communica- communication tool. Yeah. Like oh, Yelp markers. Like, fascinating. Like, yeah. There's we good the fishing interesting- here. There's good, there's caribou yeah. here. There's, you know. But the interesting side story here is that as uh, more and more tourists go visit and are taken in by the, by odd by nature and see these uh, monuments as well, they decide to build them themselves, apparently. So they're not members of the culture. They're not, no, they don't really know what they're doing. And so on a regular basis, I understand that uh, Inuit people will patrol the areas and will realize what has been added and done by people who were basically illiterate, I guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's perfect. That's a perfect way of saying it. And, and they will take those down. Good. Hmm. That is pretty, that's an awesome story. So, One thing uh, that I'm... There you have the juxtaposition of what 
stays in terms of, say, architectural features, some of the new things coming in, one new thing coming in, which is the traffic circle in the middle. And so multiply that by 10 sections. One thing that I have been just um, really excited about and very proud of, obviously, as a, as a museum uh, employee has been the, the care that has been going into this new hall over the past year from talking to you and just casual conversations because we spend a lot of time together, you know, on video shoots and stuff. And we are efforting and we are including indigenous people in the planning of this hall. And that is so important right now too. Uh, Cause you know, it, it, even just the casual patron, they're learning something when they go through that hall and we have to evolve with, you know, the culture we have to evolve. And I, I'm just really excited to see how that turns out. And it's an interesting observation. You're totally correct. Uh, Greg, uh, museums over the years have learned or evolved that it is important when you talk about other cultures and the descendants are still here, we should incorporate them in the story. It should be their story um, as much as possible. We, we need to talk to them about what artifacts we can use, how we can present them. And so we will learn from them as well. Um, and that is done across the world in museums all over and not just related to indigenous cultures of the Americas, but also in Australia. This is done in Africa. This is done in Europe. And so um, it is not totally new. It's been around for a while. But um, now with the hall being renovated, it is our chance to also engage. Mm -hmm. And we will. Yeah, it's just it's such a and especially in this week, obviously, we had Indigenous Peoples Day. And right. so a lot of that has been on people's minds and it's mm -hmm. important that that stuff is not just, uh, it's just not kept to just to one week in October, you know, that we remember this all the time. And I know that we're also having a lot of video components in mm -hmm. this new hall. You're working with John Danielson. He's on our marketing team. He does all the videos and stuff. Um, I know you guys are working really hard on that too and having video components. So these people can actually speak to our patrons first person and tell them tell their exactly, story yeah, tell their stories yeah. yeah just like you said somebody who's literate in the culture in their own culture instead of having it interpreted through somebody else who is an an outsider so to speak i mean and i don't mean that in a negative way just in a way a truthful way sure. right let them tell the story because they know that story best and language in its own right unless it's uh carved in rock or painted on, on ceramics mm -hmm. or written down with ink on paper um, is intangible. It's something right. we, you know, we hear sounds and they make sense. Yeah. But language is so important to keep your culture together. Mm -hmm. So if you're a parent and you are instilling values and knowledge into your children, you do it with language. And mm -hmm. ideally you do it in your indigenous language, your native tongue. And if you lose that, then you lose a large part of what used to be your cultural inheritance. Mm -hmm. And so there will be in the exhibit a reference, not just a fleeting reference, but there will be a discussion of the topic of boarding schools. And that, that's a whole different thing altogether. It's yeah. a sad story. It is. But it's a necessary point to um, reflect on. To memorialize but, really, right? Like, right. Don't, well, don't forget, learn. Know. Yeah, that people know because this is mm -hmm. certainly not widely known. It is of late coming more and more into the news. But for example, um, there's so many points to connect here, Kat. This is just yeah. the introduction, um, the lead up to the center of the exhibit where we will have panels and maybe a, a video where somebody will share um, that kind of experience. And then, for example, the person who will come down from uh, Nunavut, the northern part of Canada, he uh, lived that experience. Wow. He was taken away from um, his native world uh, in, in the far north. And so he used to live in an igloo and then was taken down south to be civilized. And so is that it, that was in Canada? In yeah. Canada. It was done yeah. in Canada as well as in the United States. Yeah, yeah, I know that I've talked to a lot of, I have a lot of friends, uh, you know, all over the world, obviously, but I have a lot of friends in Canada and the United States experience and our mishandling of all that 
is not, uh, I mean, we're not alone in that. Canada oh, no. also, Canada also has a lot of issues too, that they are still working through and to their credit, you know, they are, they're more vocal about it. I think than we are, I, I would like to say that this isn't a political show. No. And I'm just saying, you know, that yeah. I think right. we forget that, you know, Canada also well, had Australia a lot. and yeah. all kinds of places had similar programs. It, it was. Yeah. But what's important now is that a museum like ours, you know, in the, uh, you know, third largest city in the United States now. Um, really? Okay. Well, I just, I just pushed this over Chicago because okay, uh, we just we beat the White Sox. So okay. it's in my brain. I can see that. There you go. And, uh, you know, and for us to be able to tell that story mm -hmm. on such a big level is right. a very important thing. And, and what you just mentioned, um, it's not just the United States, it's also Canada, but we can continue Mexico and areas for the South mm -hmm. because needless to say, and that's part of the story, when the Europeans finally showed up, there were people on the shores waving back at them everywhere. Yep. So yep. from Alaska all the way to Tierra del Fuego, there were yep. people that had been living here, as we now know from the latest discoveries since at least 23,000 years ago. It's crazy. So there were people here. And so mm -hmm. inevitably, there was the mistreatment started as soon as the others showed up. And that was not just in the United States and Canada. You go down to Mexico, you go down to Nicaragua, you go down to Panama, you go down to Brazil, all the way down to Argentina and Chile. Same story. Yeah. Really I think that, that gets, um, I mean, I guess that goes back to, we could go even farther back. That's just mankind, you know, not to get on off a Craig tangent here, but mankind is not kind. And we, we don't treat each other with respect, yeah. but I hope so. I hope that, halls like this, the hall of Americas and other things that we have coming down the line here at the museum, you know, shows that there could be a better way. We can actually, we don't right. have to, you know, and so village. if I could add here, yeah. the um, advisory group we put together will help and steer us in making sure that that part of the story definitely is told right. But We've also shared with them already that the engagement the museum wants with them and others yet to come later on is not just going to be like Native American uh, Day just once and that's it. We want this to continue well past mm -hmm. the opening of the hall for many years to come. And in the exhibits, we are planning to, we use the word to refresh. So occasionally there will be uh, opportunities maybe to display new things or to broach a new subject. And this is something, no doubt, the advisory board can tell us about. Maybe you should tell this story. And so we can keep right. it fresh, keep it up to date. And so the hall will evolve and become closer and closer. It will never be perfect, but it will be closer and closer to reflecting what people would like to see on display. And, and I think all of our halls have done, I mean, have done a good job of that. Um, you know, I know that I even see things now that, you know, 10 years since the paleo hall opened, there's yeah. still things that can probably, and that will be refreshed and everything. Right. And, but That's not being whole... perfect is the point, right? Yeah. Just yeah. like and... science, just like any kind of discipline, you know, you grow, you learn more and new things, and then you have to adjust and refresh yeah. and, you know, incorporate those, you know, changes and different ideas into into our structure. I mean, I'm, I'm just a baby, but I can imagine how, <laughs> how you guys have seen museums evolve. I know even oh, through the so paleo different. side of things, our ideas mm -hmm. of just what they, what some dinosaurs and these creatures, how they walked has changed. Oh, yeah. And that goes back to the anthropology, anthropology right. aspect of things that we, we, we change, mm -hmm. we evolve and having an advisory board, is so important too. And we need to, we're making sure that that's transparent and making sure that people know who we're talking to and that, you know, you don't, you, you want to get expert knowledge and not even just expert knowledge, but people that have lived with it, not people that have just read books on it and they right. actually still live with it. Right. And that's a special mm -hmm. thing. And I'm so proud that we are doing that. And so am I. Yeah. And you're the guy that's doing it. So there you go. Well, let me, let me use that opportunity. <laughs> yeah, to who's, say, yeah, tell us about uh, your team. Tell us about the team. This is not the Dirk yeah. show. This yeah, is a team go. within uh, the collections and exhibits departments, both uh, dealing with the uh, belongings or objects, 
maintaining them, but also uh, in this case, preparing for display. We have had conservators come in to work on certain items that needed a little bit more TLC because over the years, things like, for example, our kayak needed some work because it would be reenacting the Titanic scene once more if we had tried to launch it in the new hall. It had a few openings, yeah. uh, but not the right ones. And so we had to clean it up and fix it. So uh, people within the two departments, you know, content-wise, object uh, care in collections, and then the display, and the talented team in the exhibits department that will make it all pop. Uh, and in the new technologies involved that are way over and beyond my pay grade, as they say, you know, to make um, the, the exhibit a totally new experience. And for example, we're working on this. I have no doubt, and this is putting the burden on the exhibits team, but I have no doubt it will look great. But when you walk into any exhibit hall, typically you're looking at things, things, objects, fossil specimens on display but that's in display cases in the wall or standalones in front of you. But there's, there's one particular dimension, of sort of the wall is vertical dimension, but then there's a floor mm -hmm. and then there's also a ceiling. So we're trying to figure out ways to also make those spaces relevant, specifically yeah. the ceiling. And so there is work in the pipeline there. That I'm curious. I'm away. real curious now. Are we that, talking that, like that. cabinet of curiosity ceiling space um, use or is it a surprise? Not, more like a moving experience. Oh, Ooh. we're not having crocodiles on the wall, on the ceiling. Um, <laughs> no, that would be alligators in this part. Yeah, of the that's wall. true. Uh -huh. yeah. Or Cayman. Uh, there sure. we go. I, but you know, anyway, like, one thing. Other museums have done it and we yeah. are going to see if we can Good do Good deal. I was going to say one thing that I have in just in my lifetime of going to halls like this of, at museums, you know, across, across the country as I was little or just growing up, I remember, and this is maybe just my personal recollection. I remember when I would see a hall that was about indigenous peoples or it was about native tribes, that it was all very centered on their clashing and their violence and huh. warring. Yeah. And uh, from what I've spoken, when I've spoken with you about this kind of stuff, the hall, this hall is not going to be, it's, I remember going to halls and just seeing nothing but, you know, implements of, you know, uh, human destruction, you know, knives, uh, clubs, things like that, that were just, that, that sort of reinforced this viciousness of, of indigenous yeah. people, which I think it was probably a, a byproduct of the culture at the time. And I don't, I'm glad we're sort of, we're moving away from that. Yeah, um, we, we are all human beings as you observe yourself. So we have a good side and a bad side. Yeah. And that, no culture is exempt of that. But um, at the same time, whatever message might have been sent, hopefully was unintentional, but it was still sent about right. native cultures are A, primitive and B, violent. Yes. Um, yes. Typically, when you mention the word Aztec, even though people might not necessarily always be able to put them in the right part of the world, in, in this case, yes. in the Americas, they usually offer one observation. Oh, yeah, there were cannibals. Right. Same yep. applies yes. to people uh, that lived in our area, the Karankawas. Mm -hmm. If people ever heard of them, they oh, yeah, there were cannibals. And that's just the PR part on the uh, Europeans coming in saying, sure. yeah, those guys yeah. deserve to be defeated, deserve to be eliminated mm -hmm. because they were bad people, don't you know? And they were right just back home to the kings and queens. They were justifying their own bad behavior by making somebody else's behavior worse somehow. And so instead, what we want to do is with modern uh, works of art, in some cases commissioned, in some cases acquired as they had been finished already, is to showcase um, how uh, Native people, Indigenous people today are um, creative. Mm -hmm. uh, and creative in three dimensions in this case, because these are objects on display. But with, they come with stories, and they are stories that the artists who made them can share with us because they're very much alive. And we cannot also say, this is made by, and mention the name of the person with the biography, and then um, showcase what it is they want to share with us. So it's not going to be a war club, and oh yeah, they were shrinking heads. Yeah. Right. Yeah. They, today we have native people who carry on their traditions and then some. We have one uh, bowl, a beautiful painted bowl, um, the size of a regular uh, calendar that you would use to you know, put your groceries in, your salad in, and let it uh, just uh, drip. 
and it's painted on the inside. It's done by a person who lives in New Mexico, but the imagery on the inside is Mexican. Not, it's old Mexico, if you want. It's, it's uh, Yucatan, central Mexico. Mm -hmm. It's a figure known as a chacmul, which is a reclining figure uh, with the knees pulled up. And yes, yeah. this was used in ancient cultures, supposedly to um, sacrifice people on like right. the Aztec temples. But he um, used it um, to tell a story. And so it's painted on, and it's not a bloody or gory story. It's more a reference to archaeology and, and the quest for knowledge. Mm -hmm. And so that's going to go on display. But it's going to go on display in the quote-unquote wrong section because, hey, I know what that is. And I've seen this when I went to see a site in Yucatan, in Chichen Itza, right. for example. And it's going to be in the New Mexico section. So wait, what? That's in the wrong section. The museum made a mistake. No, we did not make a mistake. And here's why. So we stop you in your tracks. We make you look. And, you may, and then you learn. And then yeah. you walk out and I'll be right behind you, kind of incognito, hearing, listening to hopefully what they will say, which is, I had no idea. Yeah. I did not know that. Then what, helping you draw connections through time and place right. and all of those different things and see things more holistically instead of in sections. Yeah. Going back to that, that aspect of, you know, always highlighting the violence of a culture. I've noticed we've always done that. I, even going back to European, like the Vikings, we don't, people are of, attracted to violence, right? Yeah. Yeah. And I know we don't even, we don't, when we think of like the Vikings or, you know, I was going to say like, you know, European derived, you know, settlers or, you know, it's always, you know, we're always excited about going to the Aztec thing. Oh, they ripped each other's hearts out and they cut each other's heads off and stuff. We don't even think about the technology behind these things, not the, not the killing machines, but the technology that they even, you know, evolved or things mm -hmm. that we are still using today when it comes to like even numbers and science and just right. little incremental things. We, we, we love to talk more about how they, uh, yeah, how they sacrifice people and stuff. That goes with every single culture for some reason. Now, uh, yeah. back uh, to the Aztec, in the section where we will display Aztec materials, but also other central Mexican materials, mm -hmm. uh, Mexico City and their environment. Um, we're going to, we're working on this today or right now, and this, we will have this uh, screen that will show, I'm calling it Mexico City then and now, because Mexico City, the modern capital, huge, one of the right. largest cities in the world, and certainly in, in this part of the world, much bigger than New York, for example, and mm -hmm. maybe even Houston, I don't know. But it is sitting on top of the colonial city, Mexico City again, yeah. and then those two layers are sitting on top of the Aztec capital. Yeah. And so what we're planning and hoping to be able to achieve is to uh, showcase the original uh, huge lake system that existed, mm -hmm. the islands that were there. With the Chinampas. The, yeah, and where the Aztecs settled, because when they showed up, they were Johnny come lately. So there were plenty of people already mm -hmm. living on the shores, and they told them, not in my backyard, go live yep. on that rock over there, and they did. And they slowly built up what became Tenochtitlan, or their capital. And so over time... Um, this city grew, became one of the largest capitals in the pre-contact world. Mm -hmm. And then here come the Spaniards, they incorporated in their city, and then eventually the lake is drained, and now it becomes this megalopolis. Yep. And so we want, but in that megalopolis that is Mexico City today, there is a continuation. If you go to the center of the city, there are uh, still ruins visible, because even though the Spanish did their best to blow everything up, some of these temples were too large to completely mm -hmm. destroy. So they're still sticking out above the surface, which their original surface is probably about 10 to 15 feet further down. The Mexican president's palace is sitting on top of an Aztec emperor's palace. So, you know, and occasionally in somebody's backyard or even in a courtyard that belongs to the main cathedral right next door to the presidential palace. If some work needs to be done and you start digging up somebody's mm -hmm. yard, boom, they find all kinds of Aztec. Well, that was just a deal. When you went in, <clears throat> you built yeah, on top of the other person's palace or you put your holy space on top of right. the other people's holy space. It was a way of sort of erasing Erasing them and replacing, and replacing. replacing. That's the yeah. was it the concept of is that cultural layer where I, I know that Dirk, you have even uh, talked about this before. Like in Europe, you can do that. You can find late Roman oh, yeah. ruins all over in there. your you backyard. Can, in your, yeah, you can. Yeah, 
I, yeah. I was reminded, for example, the same thing in Europe, a lot of the highways, main connectors between cities that go way back to the Bronze Age, well before the Romans, um, would have had at one point or another Roman highways. Yep. And those modern highways today tend to follow. They're not necessarily built on top, but they tend to follow a straight line is the easiest way to connect two points. So, sure. you know, if you go between, I don't know, a city in Germany like Cologne, and Paris, yeah, you might find Roman highways, and they are now replicated today in uh, high-speed railroad systems and uh, regular um, highways. The same thing applies to Mexico City. You had not the same. They didn't have the wheel. didn't have horses. Radiating. They were, they were connecting the island to the mainland, and they build levees, and people mm -hmm. walk across these levees. And so today, the lake is gone, the levees are no longer there, except the avenidas yeah. follow the exact same, the main thoroughfares. And they're like spokes, right? Boulevards, yes. Yeah, they coming out from out the, center. the center. Which was the yep. city. And then, so it's fossilized Aztec history that is still with you, even though most people might not realize. It. I like that term, fossilized history. <laughs> fossilized. That's actually awesome. One thing I've always wanted to know, are we going to include anything from the, the the tribes that lived in our area here in Houston, here in this Houston area? Well, that, uh, am I getting the cart before the horse? No, um, we're reaching out to people. There are very few. That's a sad part of the history of Texas. Very few people. The closest uh, would be the Alabama Cushada people in Livingston. Yeah. And then we have a cattle people on either side of the border, Louisiana and Texas. Down here, we do have people in the city. We have Native American people, of course. Um, we do have on display in our paleo hall, at the very end, the human evolution section, we have uh, stone tools. And we do have a few those, items. Those are from the Galt site, right? Yes, we do yeah. have a Galt site. Yeah, um, yeah. Or there are additional, and the Friedkin site is another name for it. But we also have, for Harris County, a uh, Clovis spear point. Yeah. So long before we were all driving up and down the highways here in Houston um, and then thinking, oh, my God, I forgot my notes at home or where did I put my car keys? Yeah. There was somebody slapping his or her forehead saying, where did I? <laughs> Where's put my, my Clovis point? My Clovis point. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And we lost it and we found it and we have it on display. So human presence here goes back mm -hmm. 15,000 years. So who is it? It was we had the Caranca was here. We're, yes. we're, we're, we're all sitting right now that was Karankawa land. Yeah, among, okay. yes. And the, there are several daughter groups within them. And so this is an important point you raise. Um, one of the very small but necessary baby steps to be followed by others is what is now known as a land acknowledgement, which is done um, at museums, at conferences that deal with native cultures which is to recognize and honor those who were here before and were stewards of the land. And so there will be a text panel. Usually at meetings, you hear people say this, we recognize that those who were, were sitting or we're currently in a building that is on top of the land that used to belong or still belongs to some tribes are still around. Uh, and then people mention their names. So um, that is a reference, uh, an acknowledgement we will make at the three different entrances to the uh, hall. Um, and then throughout, we will recognize those who are still with us. In some cases, for example, El Paso in Texas, that's um, the uh, Isla del Sur, the Teva speakers, who are still here. And those are recognized tribes. There are other people who are in the area as well, further south, um, in the border area with Texas and Mexico. And again, Kat, this is connecting dots. Um, there are areas there where it used to be that the ancestral lands were on either side of the border. Mm -hmm. Here come uh, the Spanish and yeah. eventually the Americans, and uh, and they just eventually draw a line right through the homeland. Just an artificial, right, arbitrary, like yeah. Yeah. which then at one point resulted in U.S. cavalry raids from the Brownsville area into northern mm -hmm. Mexico right. to subdue those, again, violent, barbaric people, quote-unquote, their words, not mine. Mm -hmm. And so that then resulted in uh, lots of people dying and some children taken away yeah. from boarding schools. That's not a doc. And so you just it never ends. And we need to reference it, talk about it, among other things, and it will be. And that is awesome. How, and I think how, important. Uh, 
It is how, how, or how recent in our history were there Karankawa uh, here in the, I guess, the modern Houston era, Houston area? I know of some people who are um, members of, and this is in Louisiana, the border area over towards Baytown, and in here as well, uh, 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 Beaumont and Bay- Baytown much closer, um, that are members of the uh, daughter um, groups, if you want them were related to the Karankwa. Got it. Um, so, but in most cases, the, the story with the Karankwa is that they were basically uh, pushed out further, further mm-hmm. south, and eventually, as they were pushed from Texas into Mexico, from Mexico into Texas, they, um, the story goes, uh, in most cases, disappeared. Um, that's not quite true, because that is a story we want to fight. That well, they sort of got... They were absorbed into other groups. Yeah. They... You know, in you some cases, um, this is an expression that a colleague of mine, Adam Mickler, when he would write the catalog for the Amazon collections, he would make a point. Let me see if I can get this correct. A culturally extinct, genetically surviving. Right. And so uh, I can speak for myself. I am 2% Neanderthal. Mm-hmm. So I, you could argue biologically. I didn't call. know that, Dirk. That's a good thing to know about you. Ne- next time, look at my knuckles. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> And whenever I walk by a cave, I'm drawn into it. But anyway, you, uh, Neanderthals and, and the DNA of Neanderthals continue to survive in an awful lot of people of European origin. But um, culturally, I don't, you know, I wouldn't know yeah. how to make a, a, a spear point. Yeah, you don't know how to behave as a Neanderthal. Well, uh, some people might disagree with that and say, no, Kat, he does. Because- I have a higher percentage of Neanderthal okay. DNA than you. Okay. So last year I did my Mm -hmm. ancestry.com. I spit in a little tube and sent it off. And I figured we found out that I am 6% indigenous Americas dash Mexico. My ancestors came from Nueva Leon um, and South Mm -hmm. Texas. So we were in that little, the part of, I guess that that sort of like the absorbed part. And that was 6% of me is that, and that's, it was really cool to see that too. And it just made me, get obsessed last year with, with those people. And we were all over the Southwest. So uh, I say we like, you know, uh, but you know, that was, that was cool to see that with a uh, mixed in with all my Czech ancestry due to my last name and everything like that, that I had that little 6% that is just like in there. I'm looking at it right now and it's, it's really cool. 6% so, is pretty big actually, Craig. There you go. I mean, it, I don't it know. Is. I don't know what, uh, you know, it, it, I'm proud of it for sure, obviously, but then I have a lot of Spaniard in me as well. So <laughs> the, this is not a commercial for ant for ancestry.com at all, but uh, <laughs> I, it was just cool to see that. And it also brought back, brought home to, you know, the point of the new hall is that, you know, we are still here. I don't mean we, but those people are still here. Right. Right. And, you know, they, um, and so yeah. in your case, for example, you have the, uh, genetic component in you. Mm-hmm. But you have people who still speak the languages or still living within the communities. If you go to New Mexico, uh, make, the one make one point. If you go up to Taos, for example, mm-hmm. there is a, a community there where there is a structure in the center of um, the indigenous community. And it's made uh, from adobe mud brick, about three, of, three stories high, I think. Uh, a mid-rise, as we would call it here in Houston. And that has been refurbished and refurbished and inhabited, as they say, for about a thousand years. So this is one, usually when you go to the sort of Jeopardy quiz-like questions, oldest continuously inhabited community in the United States, people will slap that, you know, red button and go, St. Augustine. Well, right. Yeah, but there are other cities or communities that have been continuously occupied, and this is one of them. And they happen to be Native American and they're still with us. And so we tend to forget that. Yep. Why is I think, that? I think going back, I, now that I think about that, it's not that far away. I think my grandfather Gonzalez told me that he had a great grandma that did not speak English or Spanish. And all she spoke was a native there you language. Go. And so I, you have that oral history, a little yeah. bit of yeah. survival. So he had he had a a grandmother or you know some sort of elder relative that he right. remembers seeing like right. at family functions that was, you know, 
sweet and kind, but didn't speak <laughs> English, didn't speak Spanish. But it becomes but, smaller and smaller as yeah. it goes out from there. And that's where you're yeah. talking about being culturally extinct, right? And so yeah. um, about two years ago, we had an opportunity to travel to central Mexico, to a state called Puebla. Um, and visited a community where we interviewed people. This mm -hmm. was part of a larger project, but we interviewed people and uh, we had people from the Mexican government with us uh, from the museum in, in Mexico City. And uh, they were facilitating, but also translating because we met people, there were three generations, grandma, daughter, granddaughter. And they were talking about the customs in the community. Of course, they live in a, in a country which, when the Spanish came in, there was heavy, heavy, heavy pressure to convert to Catholicism, to Christianity. Mm -hmm. And so they did. And so there's a church, there are churches everywhere, colonial period, modern churches, mm -hmm. et cetera. And then as they were talking, we heard the same story three times about, yes, we are Christian, but at the same time, we still go pray to our gods. Oh, and then they start mentioning, and you can I could hear the, the names, the references to uh, Aztec entity. Yeah. But the interesting part of this three-part conversation was that the grandma, and this is why we needed the translator, um, she, uh, he asked her questions in uh, Nahua, which is the yeah. modern version of Nahuatl, the Aztec. So it's modern Aztec. Right. And she started talking, and I was lost. I could only hear occasionally a reference. Oh, that's a reference to a god. Still mm -hmm. the same name. And then she spoke, uh, she spoke Spanish. And so I could follow the story much better. And I'm assuming she translated more or less the story she had first mentioned and, and given to us in uh, modern Aztec. Then it was turned for the, the daughter, the middle generation. She could speak Nahua, but not as good as grandma. Right. So she was starting to lose it. And then she spoke Spanish fluently. So same story came up again. Mm -hmm. And then the granddaughter, you can guess. Yeah, only Spanish. Spanish. Yeah. He could reference the gods in their original Aztec Nahuatl names. Mm -hmm. And so over the span of three generations, in front of our own eyes, we observed and recorded yeah. this loss of culture. It's disappearing. It's disappearing, yes. So different mm -hmm. cultures are fighting back, and it is done in that region as well, through uh, education, to and this is done elsewhere in the world as well. Native languages are yeah. endangered and they're, yeah. they're becoming extinct. And so in as much as is possible, people are trying to teach native tongues. That is difficult because remember a century ago or less, it was beaten out of them. Yep. Oh, speak your native tongue, it's bad. And all right. stuff, no, it's not, it's good. Right. But knowledge was lost. I met a young man this past weekend, actually. This gives me hope. He was probably 19 or 20 um, and he was, from Guatemala. And I, I was talking about how wonderful it is that he was bilingual. And he says, I'm trilingual. He spoke, you know, and I don't know the, the name of the language, um, the original Maya or not original, but a Maya dialect, I'm assuming, and then Spanish and English. And so there's their pockets, right? Yes. And uh, Guatemala is a good example where um, within the Maya world in Guatemala is a large portion of it. And then you have neighboring countries like Belize and, and um, El Salvador, mm -hmm. Honduras, and of course, uh, the southern part of Mexico, where I think it's 29 languages are spoken. The language, oh. they're not dialects, they're languages. So they are spoken in some cases by hundreds of thousands of people. Yeah. So they are safe, some cases increasing a little bit. Mm -hmm. And some of them, by the way, are spoken here in Texas and in Houston. And then there are other languages still spoken, but they are in small, small pockets mm -hmm. in the mountains of Guatemala. And it's one or two villages and it's right. a few other people and it's slowly, right. slowly, slowly disappearing. But there's always hope. So mm -hmm. there are videos online that anybody um, who can uh, access the Google machine can find. And you can Google um, Highland Guatemala Maya and then hip hop. Or uh, there's one, and it's hard to uh, pronounce it, it's Tutuhil. It's one of the languages. But you will see, um, and this is the beauty uh, of connecting dots done by native peoples. Um, people have cell phones. They have mm -hmm. the internet. And so they pick up on um, music um, styles that are not indigenous. Mm -hmm. But they look at it and go, hey, that has a nice beat to it. Let's do it in our language. Yeah. And so you have these video recordings put on YouTube where you see... Um, 
teenagers walking up the mountain, walking up the, the community inside the village, you know, up the street, uphill. And um, basically the, the one song I remember was a young man starting and eventually he pulls a lot of friends out of the houses that come in behind him. And there's like, come here, join me and tell the story of our people. That's so and be, cool. And be happy. And so there is always hope. People are in different ways trying to preserve their languages, their cultures. And with language, as I say, you know, there is a calendar. There is understanding of, of what made sense then and now. Mm -hmm. So if you lose it, boy, we're in trouble. It's a big loss. Yeah, it would be. Well, where I'm so excited to see this new hall and we have to wait an entire year. Or as yeah. I feel like uh, next week. <laughs> <laughs> we all feel it. Next week. Well, but you know what? I think it'll it'll it's 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 going to be well worth the wait, folks. And if you're listening to this, uh, we're going to be back here in a year talking about the amazing exactly. version 2.0 Hall of Americas. And I already we can already schedule that show. It's already scheduled that recording. <laughs> okay. I know, but between now and then, Dirk, I think you you are probably going to be highly frazzled and stressed out. So I will try no, no more than my usual Neanderthal <laughs> self. So because you're going to be, you're going to be doing a lot. Uh, I know you're going to be some sort of, you're going to be busy with Ramses and Egypt. Some probably, degree, but I have thankfully other yeah. colleagues to um, walk and talk like an Egyptian. So yes, the exhibit is in good hands. We always, we always can throw you at a, at an exhibit. Um, I know we just had to do that with Golden Jade. We had that you spoke you spoke very eloquently about Golden Thank Jade, you. and it was something that I think that you knew a little bit about, but you were still kind of like, it's it's like for I can speak for myself, but I know it's true for both of you as well, and others at the museum. It's uh, working at a museum is a very enjoyable, rewarding. You never cease to learn. That yeah. is absolutely the truth. It's the best <laughs> part also, of this job. It also, frankly, puts us in our place because you realize there's an awful lot out there. Yep. You mm -hmm. don't know. And usually it's more than you think that you do know. So there's a yeah. lot more you don't. Yeah, there, yep. there's more. There's You realize how well connected things are, you mm -hmm. know, in, in, in terms of Golden Jade is, you know, it's it's from Taiwan. It's But you were, you were able to, I heard your interviews about it. You were able to connect the dots to modern culture, um, you know, just different variations of everything. You're just really good at your job, Dirk. Well, yeah, so, Dirk, you're good at your job. <laughs> but um, yours, anybody does this, uh, refers back to the things you do know. And in the case of Jade, a Jade died. Guess what? The Maya had it. Yeah, yep. exactly. So as they say, and it was valued by both cultures. And right. And therefore, let me let me tell you a story. Yep. And we go back to more familiar terrain. And point out that the gentleman who made the Taiwanese gold and jade, especially the jade, mm -hmm. had the advantage. They were talented, still are, but they have the advantage of modern tools. Mm -hmm. Now, step back in time, move over a little bit across the Pacific to the new world. Yep. And imagine making incredible artwork out of um, jade. And we'll have some on display. Mm -hmm. How was that done without the advantage yeah. of modern tools? Somebody the other day was complaining that we had Ramses coming in. They were like, what does that have to do with natural science? What? And, and somebody put them in their place. It was really good. It was really good. They basically said, no, it's all goes under the same umbrella. And, you know, I think there is that confusion sometimes that mm -hmm. are in our name, natural science, you just think rocks and bones, but. Well, okay. give me a hot minute. I just did a teacher workshop on the chemistry and craft of Egyptian mummification. There you go. And we draw, we went all across the curriculum with geology and, uh, and so, biology and all kinds of things that went into the whole production of yeah. a, and, Egyptian burial. And that's burial. an important uh, point you raised there at the uh, at this at this juncture here. Um, you mentioned the earlier Vikings. We it brought up in my mind a beautiful show we had on Vikings. Mm -hmm. We have had. Um, exhibits temporary and permanent and permanent would be Egypt and mm -hmm. all the Americas, but we've had exhibits on non native cultures from all over the world. We had a Ukrainian exhibit. Mm -hmm. We had an exhibit on, um, the Vikings. We had one on uh, cave painters from France, prehistoric. Mm -hmm. Um, so we have covered, um, the world is a big place. Of course, we also had uh, modern Ethiopian cultures yeah. on this way, in addition to the slightly older ones. So, um, but the world is a big place. And so we haven't covered it completely. Uh, the Hall of the Americas is a permanent show, a permanent exhibit, yes. Um, and that has also raised questions in the past, and I'm sure they will continue. 
as to why there is a hall dedicated to the uh, native cultures of the Americas. And so that could be an entirely different conversation. And with the guidance of our um, advisory board, we will be able to situate that properly. Mm -hmm. um, but just as a reminder for those who are listening and watching, that we've had other exhibits before that are not dedicated to this part of the world only. We are aware of the fact that there are other people out there as well. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So, give us time, cool. guys. We're only 115 years old in the museum. We got it. We'll get to everything eventually. It's just going to take a while. We need, we need more floors. floors. We need more floors. Let's just take over the parking garage and have that be exhibit space. Four floors in a basement is not enough. No, we it's not. <laughs> up, up, up. All right, guys. Thank you very much, Dr. Dirk. Thank you. Get back oh, to work. Fixing bye, up Dirk. All, of America. all right. See you guys. Kat, Thanks. Kat, go back to doing your skull stuff. Whatever <laughs> Cat does. And then uh, I got to go take the little dog out. He's all right. Bye, guys. Right. Thanks, bye, Dirk. Everybody. A pleasure as always, guys. Later, See guys. You later.